Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on with it, man. They give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Can't be cleared hot. Look at this. I don't know if you know this, but I just started this new water company. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> it doesn't spray on you like the old, the first batch did. That's cool. Wait a minute. What? Why would the first batch spray on you? Um, like a decided Korean man with a hard dick? Dude, I didn't realize how complicated water is. They have a, it's a process. What is the thing that you put the gas in there? Um, carbonation? Carbonation. No, no, not carbonation. It's, it's that, uh, whatever it is, the gas that fills up. Your, you, your listeners are like, dude, this dude's a dumbass. The thing that you put into it to kind of fill the, the void, you have to put something in it. It's like a... Why don't you just fill it to the top of water? <laughs> there's some thing you have to do. I don't Whatever it was. I didn't realize there was technicality behind water because this everyday water is literally out of my garden hose at my house. So, I My plan was to <laughs> refill it with the garden hose from my house. Yep. After I drank it, re, I'm saving the caps and then... Uh, you can, you can. Yeah. It's water. There's nothing fancy about water. Here's what's fancy about this water. It's an aluminum can. And, you know, I, that's why I appreciate... I actually appreciate Liquid Death's marketing moves on it because um, it, it does save plastic, and we drank a lot of plastic water bottles oh, yeah, there's a in, ton. overseas. That probably wasn't healthy for us. Um, Longer shelf life, too. Yeah, and because the branding on the outside, you can tell it's, it's adhered as... Most beverages are. They could probably strip that and reuse it. I'm assuming. Yes, that's why. Smelt it down or whatever term they yes. would uh, deem appropriate. That's better for recycling too. By the way, if like there's a lot of printed cans, but that's dye on aluminum. There's a other process, I guess, to yeah. unscrew that. But it's a 25 year shelf life. How long? I know you and I. You've been telling me about this for a while. This is the yesterday or the date. Well, the night before yesterday. When you guys showed up and we offloaded, it was the first time I'd ever physically seen one of the cans, though. Oh, yeah. How long have you been working on it? Dude, it's been a year. It's so weird. It's like you think something in concept is easy to do. You're like, it's canned water. How hard is that? It's hard. It's not easy. And in America, sourcing anything in supply chain is a challenge. So my whole thing was like, oh, I want to get this in retail and distribution because I want to teach people about preparedness. And if they're drinking water, why not drink Philcraft water? And then hit this uh, QR code and learn about preparedness, like tourniquet application, situation awareness. Is that where that goes? Yeah. So the new version is going to have that QR code front and center because it's kind of small, yeah. and most people don't scan QR codes on cans unless there's value. So I think our value proposition was let's put it front and center and go, hey, learn about something. If you're going to drink water, you might as well learn something. So I like it. It, the Kalispell thing, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the only place in Kalispell where you can get this stuff. It, it, that is the only place you can get it. <laughs> and it's the, well, I guess we'll give people tap water. Yeah. But what we'll do is we'll charge them a ton. We'll open one of these and pour it through a fake tap. <laughs> Gravity fed. You can get draft water if you want to <laughs> off the of tap. It's a garden hose attached to a. Yeah. Dude, yesterday's event. It was was crazy. amazing. So this will come out. At, we're recording this on a Sunday. This will be out in five days on a Friday. Wait, during your grand opening or before your grand day opening? Before, day before the grand opening. Ooh. Which your event was the, I mean. It felt like a grand opening. There was a lot of people there. That was by far the most people we've had there. And that's why it was a perfect stress test for the system. Everybody was outside. The fires were all going. The pellet stoves, the overhead heaters. It didn't feel. S like somebody who will remain nameless, but John didn't test the microphone. You know. <laughs> I had a scream. My voice is done. <laughs> it's so fried. It was it was really cool, man. I, congratulations on that. The Black Rebel Coffee that you stood up, I think it separates itself from every single one of them. I've been to all of them. I was going to say, you've been to a bunch. I've been to all of them. It looks different, and I, we wanted to build it to feel different than it all feels, the other ones. It feels... What it, the difference is um, you want to get a coffee, and you want to stay in that one. Yeah. Right, it, it, not that you like the Bernie one is actually really cool uh, near Jared's uh, place, Jer uh, JT's place. It, it's like an intimate kind of setting. Yeah, but you you don't want to you want to drink coffee, do your business, and head out. Right, the Wi Fi is there, the connections there, it's cool. But this one just feels a lot different, man. It feels like like if I live local, I would be going there to do my work, drink my cup of coffee, hang out with friends. It's it's really cool. Like and and dude, I did, I honestly didn't realize. I told my friend I told my um 
my team. Your brief is probably like, hey, like I have to do this because I told Andy I would. It's probably going <laughs> to suck. It's going to be like a hot dog stand and like drip coffee. <laughs> so let's just get through it. And everybody like put a smile on your Suck face. it up, guys. It's Montana. That's a good thing. Uh, well, we, when we originally planned it, when we w- the first video I did with you, which is on our, was that on my YouTube or your YouTube the channel? The like be more specific. The walk around of the hole that was in the that ground. was put on yours. Okay, and so, that was in the summer of last year. And we like there was we could still see sunlight coming through the grating in the roof. Oh, that was okay. So that was on my personal Mike Glover actual, mm-hmm. and we did the tour, and I was like, holy crap, this is just like a hole of concrete in a brick building. Yeah, and dude, it's okay to say you didn't have vision. I did you not. Did, I couldn't you didn't see have it. it. And now it's like, <laughs> what the hell is that? I it, really yeah. like the other stores. And Denver and I have been to quite a few of them. Like I spent a good amount of time in uh, Niceville and went to that store. And it was so awesome, too. The GM, who didn't know us from Adam, we told him who we were. And he's like, hey, come on back and we'll show you everything. Showed us oh, the back cool. of the house. Where and is this at? It was in Niceville, Florida. Oh, okay, okay. Which... If you put a gun to my head, it would still take me a while to find it. I know it's in Florida, but where in Florida is nice, yeah. nice is I'm not positive. Was it busy? Uh, we caught it midweek at an off time. There was people in there. Yeah. Um, but just like we have found, so we opened the 1st of February. We've been open now for about t- almost on 20 days. It's a sine wave. Morning, a little bit of slack. Yeah. Midday, a little bit of slack. Evening. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are the slowest. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are just booming. Like I was looking at the cameras today. There was... 50, 60 people hanging out in there. How often, I'm curious to how, I mean, it's there's only a few uh, Black Rifle Coffee shops that are owned and operated by people who have kind of celebrity status in this thing, whatever whatever this thing and is. And BRCC Kalispell is not one of them. You, yeah. You are a celebrity. You're a celebrity. I am not. Did you, you notice you, that when we did the q and A, I I walked off and just left you there? <laughs> <laughs> you abandoned me on top of your truck, and on top of your Ford? You got, you got pinned to the rear quarter panel of my truck for over an hour. Yeah. I you know how many people it, pinned me? Yeah. Zero, because I left. I know. You rolled out. I did. You you went out the back door. I like that. I did. Because you're the celebrity. It, dude, I'm the host. Well, here's the thing is like you're the celebrity who lives there. Like you're constantly going to be there. Yeah, I'm there all the time. Yeah. It, so that's that's what I was going to ask is, I mean, I would think people would come to this Black Rifle Coffee if, I mean, I, I didn't realize this. So, so here's one of the mistakes I made. I, I said to some of my team, I was like, I don't know how popular that Kalispell, Montana, Black Rifle is going to be. Neither do we. And because I was like, is the demographic like who's the demographic here? Is it is it conservative Montana guys? And then how much coffee do they drink? It's from I looked at it. It's about five eleven to six foot one, handsome males with massive cocks, Be- beards, and just big old big dongs. balls. Yep, big cocks <laughs> and big beards. You know what I mean? Big. Girth, it was girthy. Girthy. <laughs> Every, it's funny because everybody looked like a freaking backcountry hunter. Like everybody would look. Like, I was like. What the fuck? Dude, we started a militia. Yeah. I mean, now- this, <laughs> you're, balloon boys. Listen, you're already a domestic terrorist. I am. I've, I've been known this for one. years. The fact that it got out, I apologize. I know we were- You really, compromised I my, did. my cover. For people who don't know, we started a militia yesterday. It's called the Balloon Boys. I realized later that we were- That's not inclusive language. Yes. So- And you realize you probably- like Just like the Proud Boys was started by a joke. The origin story of Proud Boys was like a joke. And for people who can't- fucking hear my sarcasm i'm 100 percent kidding <laughs> just like i was when i said it yesterday and there probably was somebody in the audience who thought i was serious and they're like oh yeah yeah and our mission is to movie. shoot balloons whether you see them at a birthday party yeah. at the toyota dealership we take them down <laughs> somebody shot a balloon yesterday after that i hope not they were motivated because i was joking <laughs> it didn't seem like it i thought you were completely serious on that uh, con- congratulations on that man because yeah. i did i it was so amazing that the the amount of support how nice people were. I tell my guys, and my guys are always like, dude, why do you hang around? Um, and it's not because they're inconvenienced, but it's because they they see me like wearing thin, right? And they, they know I, I wear thin when it comes to things like this. Because um, it, it's a lot of energy that you put out. But it's like, I I would never, I would stay there until the last human being was was there because I appreciate all that support for people to show up. There was a guy from North Carolina who flew in from North Carolina just to meet you and me. Do there it's are like people flying in crazy. from the East Coast for the grand opening yeah. next weekend? How crazy is that? It is. It's not something that I actually am able to comprehend. It's um, crazy, man. 
so you know Denver, my business partner, he comes from the tech world. I don't fucking know what world I come from, but neither of us had ever done like a brick and mortar, you know, business plans, not new, necessarily new to that, but a brick and mortar, a service industry, seasonal, the summer months are what are much busier. It's been an interesting journey. I mean, we found ourselves in basically a develop a developer role, which we didn't think we were going to be in, you know, yeah. working at a deeper level with the architects and with the construction and the construction delays. It was wild. It was over two years to get that thing done. It's crazy, man. It's a lot of commitment, a lot of work. And I, I think the, the cool thing is it's almost like you're – I mean, the coffee shop is so different, but some of the tactics that you implemented are so necessary. Um, so my number one thing, the only tactic, if I'm being totally honest, the, the most important thing that we did – and you're a business owner, and it's wild for me to think now that I am too – I mean, I, I guess I've had businesses, but I kind of just use them as far as like invoicing. Yeah. The most important hire we made was our general manager, a woman named Tanya. I met her, yes, she's right. She's a Super fucking cool boss lady. She's our DD, because yeah. DD's a boss lady. Yes. For Field Craft Survival. 100%. Um, and then Denver and I, we want to be coffee shop owners, not coffee shop operators. And yes. from the very beginning, and the, the only time we've actually sat down with all of this staff when we started this staff training because uh, Black Rifle flew up a mobile training team, which was nice because it saves us from having to send people. Really, the only thing I said was, we all work for Tanya, to include myself. And the number one thing I care about here is the culture. Yeah. That's it. Like, it's you got to have that one person who's the flagpole on the ground. Obviously, you want everybody to be aligned with that. But finding that person and then empowering them, like the success we have had is 100% on Tanya and not on Denver and I. That's so cool, man. Yeah, I, I noticed it in the team. Like half this, the staff was wearing Phil Crafts Survival hats, and the, it, the the whole feel was like very, um, uh, it's like distressed wood, raw metal. It's Montana esque. That's what we wanted. We oh, wanted so to cool. like the bathroom is wrapped like the inside of a C one thirty with functional <laughs> jump lights <laughs> on the so shitter awesome. doors. Is it red when somebody's in there? Yeah, when they oh, lock okay. it, it goes to red. That's so badass. But yeah. yeah. And then the, the the retail area is, although it's largely, this is so funny, dude, like shit you learn along the way. We had meeting after meeting about what graphic we were going to put behind the retail area. Yeah. We pick one that's from Glacier National Park, and then 96% of it is covered by the wood display. Oh. <laughs> and Denver and I will just sit there and laugh. Like, do you remember like the six meetings we had about that fucking picture that nobody wow. could see? Wow. Yeah. It's a little stuff, man. It's cool. I, I, but, I, yeah, but open area. Yeah. And the whole thing came from Denver and I talking about where would we want to take somebody for a meeting? Where would we want to go? And yeah. we couldn't really think of a spot. So there's a bunch of – it's a huge area, but it has individual little nooks and crannies where you can talk and not be overhood, or overhood, overheard. Smart placements of plugs, you yeah. know, so people can plug their stuff in. Music, lighting, the fireplace is on 24-7. I don't think we'll have it on in the summer, but – I mean, maybe. I don't know. It's a good yeah. aesthetic. But just a place where people want to come, but it had to have the feel of Montana. Yeah. That's it, the one thing that we talked to with Evan from the beginning. Like, hey, man, like I want to build something that's Montana-esque. This is the first one in Montana, too, Correct. Right? Which is crazy. I, I think it's the biggest coffee shop in the state of Montana. We have over 4,000 square feet of inside space, let alone the outside. We have a quarter city block outside that we're yeah. still developing. I, I, so we had 300 people signed up. I think we actually had more than 300 people. I actually, I, people yeah. would come like locals and be like, how do you sign up? I was like, just- Just go out there. Just show up. Yeah, just show up. <laughs> I, what was cool is, is there was plenty of room. Yeah. And where I was positioned, I could talk to everybody in, in the open space. And, you know, we've, we've planned, I've, I've already got, I, I literally looked at it this morning. There's already another one on 12 May. That's different though, right? That's an executive protection course? No, so there, the seminar, the preparedness seminar is on Friday, which is normally what I do when I okay. come into town. And so, talk about what yeah. you do there as well, because people were asking me, like, what's Mike gonna talk about? I'm like, I haven't been to one, but yeah. it's gonna be good. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 the point of going into a community and talking about preparedness is just the convincing position. It's like, Hey guys, you might not know what this whole thing is, and we we understand that. Here's what preparedness is. Here's what it's not, and here's like a start point, a couple pro tips, a path. So I kind of I, I did that. So now the next one, I'll do a similar spiel about preparedness, 
but it will include tourniquet application. I was literally just yeah. thinking in my head. A workshop. You could add a 15-minute tourniquet application. That's what we're going to do, yeah. It's, it's crazy to me how many people realize the value of a tourniquet. They yeah. have tourniquets still in the plastic, which I'm not, I mean, carry it in the plastic if you want to. Yeah. But if it came out, they wouldn't know how to put it on. 100%. That's yeah. wild. And we've seen that. I mean, we were when we started Philcraft, um, nobody in the civilian space was teaching civilians on a large scale on, yeah. on tourniquet application. And very rapidly, we started selling more tourniquets than any civilian company in the country. And, and you know, that was, like, good to see. But we wanted to train, too. Like, it, it you can buy a tourniquet from Philgrass Survival in your coffee shop. Yes. And, and that the, the We're idea, running low now, but we're going to order more. We have to backstock it. <laughs> it. That was crazy yesterday. A lot of things went uh, out of stock. But, you know, to, to think that you can go into a Black Rifle coffee shop, drink coffee, buy a first aid or survival gear from Philgrass Survival from there – and then do a workshop uh, that outside. afternoon. Yeah, outside and learn how to how to apply a tourniquet and build community relationships is really cool. Like no coffee shop in America, I don't think any place in America outside the small places that we have in North Carolina and in um, and he- Heber City, Utah, are doing this, which is it's cool. It's like it's what it should be. It should be bringing people together. Yeah. I I mean, that actually might be the best description of what we were trying to do at that location. It's just bring people in. We want them to stay. Like, there's plenty of businesses who throttle, like, the internet connection. I mean, it's free. It it goes as fast as we can possibly get it. Yeah. We wanted to have, you know, also in their Montana Knife Company, Josh Smith. He's eventually going to have, like, a really nice high-end case. We're going to sell the blades in there as well. Really cool, man. Just to highlight. And there's a, a local axe maker. I think it's Stumptown Axes up in Whitefish. Yes, those they're, guys are awesome. They're, like, four or $500 axes. Yeah. But it's like, hey, man, I'll 100% carry this in here. Like, I'll, I'll either buy it from you or you can sell it, whatever it is. But I want to highlight as much cool shit from the valley in that store Yeah, and just hang out there. I'm, yeah. I've been there every day since – well, except for the days I was out of town because that would have physically been impossible. But. Yeah. Other than that, it lifestyle boutique, it's cool because like if if you go in there and you can get the axe, you can get the survival kit, and you feel part of that community. All the stuff that we put out, all the cross collaboration, all the partnerships, all the friendships, that's we we should be lifting each other up and collaborating. And I wish more circles of industry, genre, whatever, would get that and realize there's a lot more commonality and room to operate together that will make everybody more successful and the community your customers your clients whatever you look at as your market happier like that's the positive thing that this is doing in a very profound way and i i've i am i'm kind of i'm humbled to see that take place and i'm kind of jealous and envious that i i don't get to be part of this community more often because i want that in my own backyard and I, mean, I can get you a like a Zillow listing, if... I, dude. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm I'm thinking about it. I'm, my house is on the market now because I'm I'm making moves to Salt Lake City to be able to expand our. our You're going to bounce out of Heber, uh, dude. Heber's is it's just so small and so expensive. It's so close to Salt Lake, but so not close. At it's the not same time. close, dude. If there was a road it's that went close. directly to Salt Lake, it would be so different. It's not close, man. Yeah, you play that yeah. roundabout game. You got to go by Park City. I'm yeah. assuming you could go the other way too, but that seems like it'd be even longer. It's longer. Going down Provo Canyon's longer. Going through Park City is long. And then the, we had a record snow year that has kind of changed my outlook on this stuff cuz people can't get up the damn canyon. Yeah. The canyon, in, like, the, there's accidents every morning because of the canyons. Like, it's it's just a crazy thing, man. It's like I never thought that that would be a thing. And and Heber City is growing rapidly, and it's becoming like Park City. And I expect that kind of growth, but I didn't realize it was going to happen that fast in two years since I've been there. So I'm just going to push down into Salt Lake City, get to where our demographic is, open up a large facility, and do all the things that we do. It's yeah. going to be cool. I can't wait. What was uh, so you're coming back in March for another pillars of preparation? What's the seminar the next day? The so EP? I think it's May. So May twelfth. Is it? It's yeah. May. Or, I think it's March. No, Is it's it? not March. It can't be. That'd be next month. Yeah, it can't be. It's. I think it's May. So yeah. it's May. It's May twelfth. It's the preparedness seminar with the uh, stop the bleed, and then May thirteenth, I'm I'm doing a training um, class called personal security with Leah, with, my wife, with the wife. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I, it's going to be awesome. You know, I talked to her yesterday about some of the, the things that we're doing. We had a great conversation about that this morning. She is super fired up for the... So I'm speaking for her slightly here. She can describe it better, obviously. But the realistic survival application of jujitsu. She loves doing jujitsu versus jujitsu. I mean, she, she has loved it. She's been a high level competitor, but she also teaches the vast majority of the kids classes here at the gym. She teaches at the uh, straight blast gym here in Kalispell. And she's been a huge part of the women's program. Mm. Uh, you know, that question that woman asked us yesterday, like, what do you recommend? You know, we're a couple. It still does baffle me. Like you could have the most fucking badass, like Rambo incarnate, husband, boyfriend, significant other. And that's great if you're always with each other. Yeah. But the second that you're detached and if that's your first line of defense is to lean on somebody else to me, it just baffles me. Yeah. And you're vulnerable. I mean, well, I, much yeah. like the video that you and Leah watched, you guys watched that video of the woman in the gym being attacked. First off, that had to have happened at a weird hour. Cause if I had, I mean, like if you or I were walking by a window and we saw that, like I would break the window down and beat the living fuck out of that dude. Yes. Like obviously something yeah. was not going well there, but goddamn ladies, you got to be like sharpen your edges. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think uh, what Leah's doing is empowering women in a practical way. I think a lot of people, depending on their incentive for doing business or teaching things, um, they don't have a lot of practical application. And Leah's seen it all, right? From you know, dude, she's a rock star, but. You know, being a black belt in jujitsu is one part of a of a lifetime of experiences that has put her in a position to be the subject matter expert. And you know, we take uh, having known me for years, you know that we take being an instructor for this company very serious. Yeah, because we don't want to immediately if we put the wrong person out in front, that's going to backfire in a very poor way. So when we talk to Leah, when, when I talk to her in conversations, including our podcast on the Phil Crasserado podcast. I realized really quickly that she's the right person, especially because she's not only just focused on women, but children. Yeah. And, and there is a very specific way to train women and children in all things self-defense, confidence building, all the things. It's not, it's like the gee thing that you're, that Leah's doing with, with Denver. It's like guys think in the industry and space of men's versus women's, it's a downsize. Women's is smaller, and we'll throw some pink on there. Yeah, we'll make it pink, <laughs> we'll make it smaller, and there you go, the women's stuff. It's yeah. like, that's not how it works. There's different considerations for experiences, triggers and trauma, um, emotional barriers, uh, physical barriers, the list goes on. And it, How about I, just I'm the excited. structural difference between the male and female body? Like It's crazy. For, I mean, you know, for some gear, maybe it could it, there would be an application, but like talking with Alan yesterday, he was like, yeah, for years, Nike's idea of a women's shoe was smaller different colorways they didn't take into account any of the ergonomics the difference in the so crazy in the human form like one of the biggest shoe companies at the biggest shoe yeah. company in the world and they're just like just shrink it down it will yeah. be fun put it shrink it, it and pink. pink it is what i've heard in the shrink industry shrink it and pink it <laughs> um well lee is definitely not shrinking it and pinking it we're, no. we're this personal security course which is 13 may is going to be really exciting what do you do for yeah. that i've never been through one of those courses for you either so it's it's what it is is it's scenario based but we start with kind of the understanding of what stress is and make a clear delineation through a couple exercises of people's protocol in themselves for using deadly force like if i said to you um what's your criteria to use deadly force most people would say the legal jargon the legal answer and i'd say no 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 i mean Tell me what it would take for you to use deadly force in real life, in real time, and most people don't know. And hmm. what, like for an example, like why there is a difference between men and women. And this is a co-ed course, this one on 13 May. But a woman who, if in the scenario I'll put their children, if I said, who has kids? And a couple of people raised their hand. And I said, um, how old are your children? And they're below, let's say, teenage years. They're vulnerable, right? So if they're 17, 18, in their 20s, the instinct isn't there as much as if they're vulnerable. So if they're under five, I'm like, okay, let me pick you. And I, I stand them up and we do a scenario and I talk through the scenario in self-defense. And immediately when I put anybody near their children, 
that maternal instinct kicks in and they kill everybody. <laughs> They're like, I like the guy walks into the living room and you see the outline dead. I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. It's like the post. It's your husband. Yeah, just- <laughs> it was your husband who's home two hours late because he was getting smashed with his buddies. Yes. It's like yeah. you, you have to slow it down. But that's the difference um, that most people don't realize. They know the jargon. They know the, the technical answer. But they don't know inside themselves what the emotional answer is going to be. Yeah. Like the bet, my favorite one is when I say to somebody, um, "If your kid, you just drop your kid off and you drive away, and you hear gunshots at your school, and you know it's an active shooting, and you you park the car because you're gridlocked in traffic, and you get out of the car, what's your physical movement tactics to the front door of that school?" And they say, "I would run as fast as humanly possible." And I said, "Okay." You would run as fast as humanly possible. What does that mean? Full sprint. Okay. If you hit the door, what would you do after that? I'd go in there and I would kill the bad guy and rescue my child. I was like, you wouldn't. You would actually wind up killing somebody who's innocent or getting yourself killed. I hope it's you that gets yourself killed versus getting somebody you love killed because you would have to live with that forever. Um, but, but why is that a thing? Well, they don't understand that if they ran emotional to the front door and they hit the door at 180 beats per minute, they would be overwhelmed, not being able to make decisions. They would not be able to um, be technically proficient. They would fall apart. And and they people think, like me and you's ex-life, they think that we are adrenaline junkies. And I don't think that's true. I, you talked about is. it yesterday. Yeah, certainly there is. Yeah. I, th- I think there's a, p- a component into that that's true. But... I've never hit a target and been excited because I knew if I was overwhelmed or excited, I would make mistakes. Yeah, I would I would make decision bad decisions or potentially indecision, and I had to have a balance. So that whole thing is part of this personal security course, where people for the first time now understand how stress affects them, and then we put them through real life scenarios, force on force. A, a scenario of shooting a paper target or a still target that doesn't react barely reacts, still reacts slightly, holes react when you see them, but we don't perceive threats based off of um, based off of shoot, go, threat, or calls audibly. We do it based off of what we perceive, what we observe. And it's important for people to kind of work through those things. And I, I, I used to do it in uh, California, a version of it. And right before I would put guys into a shooting scenario, they would expect me to go, okay, begin. And they're running at 100 beats per minute, you know, slightly elevated. They would go in and succeed. Except it said, if it was a real gun, you would spike. Maybe potentially to a sympathetic response, fight or flight. Yeah. So I would grab them, and we'd have jujitsu mats, and I would roll with them. I'd start applying pressure. And some guys would have straight panic attacks, man. And then I'd pick them up, like literally pick them up off the ground, hand them an airsoft gun or a simunitions gun, and say, go do this scenario. And they look at me like, oh, my God. And then immediately they get it because now they're like at 170, 180 beats per minute, overwhelmed emotionally with a lot of stress. And now they have to technically operate and typically out the gate, they don't succeed. So, But that's yeah. actually how you're going to perform in that situation. 100%. Like that's, that's 100%. you fall to the level of your training. You don't rise to the occasion. Yes. And, and most trainers or most tactical companies or self-defense companies train to favor good outcomes. They don't train to favor bad outcomes and identify weakness. So this course, you will be vulnerable. You will see gross mistakes that you make and we'll all learn from them. Even the instructors, I will learn from them. But you will see how you actually operate under stress in real time, which is very different than most tactical training courses. Yeah, that's an interesting question to pose to people about that school shooter. Like, what would you do? Yeah. And most people get a, like I've heard, I heard a guy uh, recently, I, I think I was at Route 66 in San Bernardino, which is a great facility to train at. And the people who train with me there are super pumped and, and they're just super positive. And one of the guys was like, I, I w- I'm going to, I'm going to fucking run in that school and I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to kill all the bad guys. And I'm like, do you really think that? I'm like, yeah, I, I, I know that. Like, okay. This how, is just a guy off the street? Yeah, just a guy off the street because- it, it, it's almost like when you say something like you're in a position where you're vulnerable and you have to defend life or your family's life, the automatic default is grit or emotion. And we know how that works, like in real time with hostage rescue, with counterterrorism operations, with basic raids. 
if you're overwhelmed and you're emotional about anything, you're likely not referencing technical expertise or proficiency. And that emotion is going to get somebody killed. So you have to be, you know, it's like you said, you fall back to your level of training. If you don't have that in your repertoire, if you don't have an understanding of how you operate under stress, then the default is I'm a badass. It's like, are you a badass? Because yeah. you're saying you're a badass, but as soon as I grab you and start controlling you and you, you lose control, that's not an indication of a badass. It's like the jujitsu analogy. Like if you start to get emotional on the mats, you will get choked out. You're going to get fucked up. You will get fucked up soon. For sure. For sure. I wonder, I think people would be shocked at how slow we actually used to move on target. I mean, there's times to move very rapidly, but it's very calculated. It's, it's I don't want to say choreographed necessarily because there is a creative aspect to it. But it's not guys running around like with a chicken with their head cut off Never. by any stretch of the match. Nobody's yelling. Nobody's yelling. Whispering, talking. I mean, it's like. Yeah. It's, um, I remember like starting out in the, and people think this is conclusive. Like it's, it's, there's one answer to this. And it's certainly not. Early GWAT, we didn't know a lot. Honestly, like most organizations did not know the what SEAL the community. We fucking knew so much. We were making, <laughs> we knew so much. <laughs> We didn't want to tell you guys or like make yeah. you feel bad. See, I knew it. I knew yeah. you were hiding that stuff from us. We do hide stuff. Oh my gosh, man! Scres especially from the green berets. Yeah, no <laughs> crosstalks there. We, we, the only reason we didn't get our dicks stomped yeah. is because we were fighting an enemy enemy that was generations behind. Yes, there, centuries yeah, behind. There were fifth world yeah. tactics. Um, uh, when uh, like the original hits were all this cookie cutter attempts that um. What the textbook said, S surprise, speed, violence of action. It's what the textbook said in Vietnam. Yes. No evolution. <laughs> like, what's the lot? Like, Desert Storm? Are you looking at Desert Storm stuff? But if you look at the evolution of direct action hits when I started doing them early 2000s, and by the end of my career, by the end of my career, we were, we were taking knees at thresholds on some targets and under nods the entire time using infrared lasers to barrel dip, sometimes no lasers at all because the bad guys had a night vision capability. Even the old Sony handy cams that used to have the Dude, that IR. had the night, yeah, yep. it had the IR. And and then it was like cross coverage on a threshold and then surreptitious movement. Yep. And I mean, we went through, we went through the whole middle of the GWAT with call outs. And who would think that you would ever do a call out where you would literally call the enemy out and then use your rules of engagement to escalate force well, if you just did it the same way because you kick doors in and shoot bad guys in the face, then you just die. Because a PKM gunner barricaded behind sandbags, you're not going to defeat no matter how fast or how much speed and violence you bring. I mean, I could go between the rounds. I don't know if you guys teach that. Yeah. You, it's like, you guys it's like the water in. drip coming down. You're like, no, 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 <laughs> go. We do a lot of skipping rope. That's how we practice yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I could see that. I literally could see that. Fuck that noise. Dude, it's 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 crazy how much it's changed. But um I had a good cell leader once tell me like if you could smoke a cigarette and walk through the house. Um and I didn't understand the analogy. I didn't smoke, but I didn't understand the analogy at the time. But now I understand. It's like you're perceived like you're going fast, but you're actually if you could smoke a cigarette, you're going at the right pace where people could predict your behavior and then and benefit you and supporting you. Yeah. And people think it's like, uh, everybody says this. Everybody says, you're adrenaline junkies and you guys are crazy. It's like, I, I made the comment on the Rogan podcast where I said, um, um, being in special operations is dangerous. And some guys took that literal and were pissed off about it. And, and I was being facetious. And I think that maybe that was a lack of aptitude on their part. But I was being facetious in that, the reason it's not dangerous is because you have guys who fall back to the level of training and they're highly trained. So it's not as dangerous as somebody who's not trained. Because if you're not trained and you think you're a badass and you go into that situation. Super dangerous. It's super dangerous. You're going to fail. So I, I, I think the personal security course is a culmination of a lot of that experience. And I'm looking forward to Leah teaching her component, which is what she knows best it's the fear emotional response and and you need that perspective by the way 
My narrow field of expertise, from my experience, is not the end-all, be-all solution to any of this. It's why we have Kirsten, a law enforcement officer, female law enforcement officer, um, who was on a SWAT team in Charlotte, like a legitimate SWAT team. And her legal perspective and expertise benefits the class for everybody who's going through personal security. It's not just a green beret or a special operations guy teaching it. It's somebody like Leah with profound experience. How much more teaching are you going to do before you take a break, Mike? I, dude, I, I may have heard uh, from some of your people that you're doing too much. Yeah. I, Who yeah. are you training right now to take over Fieldcraft Survival? So I, the business side of it, so uh, here's, the, here's the, the thing with the training side. I love the training side. So technically for me, training is a vacation. It's, it's the time that I get away from the office. Pe people who don't understand, people think I'm Philcraft it, that fall into my funnel and they're like, oh, it's Mike. He is Philcraft. I'm not. I have a team that you've operated with oh, yeah. of talented human beings and instructors, Casey, uh, the Mats, Kirsten, all, um, Amber, all these great people. Kevin Estella. Like, Kevin Estella. Yep. They're rock stars. These people are Phil Craft Survival on the broad spectrum. I have to manage the operational side, the business side with my CFO on the back end constantly because we are a growing and thriving company that needs that attention. So I try to strike the balance of like doing that daily and then getting out where I go, thank God I can get away from the office. And just, <laughs> dude, no more spreadsheets, dude. <laughs> And it's a vacation. Like this, hanging out with you, doing the thing at, at, at BRCC Kalispell, it is a vacation for me. I love it. I love it. It was awesome, man. It was so cool to have that event come together. Yeah. I flexed um, my book. I, I flexed my book opening. What is it called? I don't even know. The book drop party? Book release? Book release party. I guess that's what it is. I think so. I don't even know if you're, you're supposed to do a party, but I'm doing one. Uh, June 10th at your place. Yes. I just we made that up yesterday. I'm like, I'm gonna do it at your place. First you said June sixth, then you changed it to June tenth. Yeah, June very 6th is Hafer, Tuesday. very Hafer esque of you. <laughs> very Evan of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every, you pulled I, an Evan. No, I would have waited until everybody booked the dates <laughs> and then I would have moved it and that would have been an Evan move, a Hafer move. No, that'll be awesome. I've talked with uh old Jack Carr about doing the same thing as well. It's just that's what we want yeah. the shop to be though, too. Like expose people to the cool circle of people that I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by. S same. I I think it's so cool. Well, like the book signing thing. The reason I flexed it here is because I didn't realize that Phil Craft, anybody knew who we were in the middle of Montana. Was your team surprised uh, yesterday? They were like dry heaving by the end of the day because they were so like, oh my God. John was just harder than he's ever been in his life. Just R rock, rock hard. hard. <laughs> R-O-K hard. <laughs> Republic of Korea hard. Yeah. It, it, it was it was so impactful on the team, but I was impacted, and that's why we flexed it because I was like, I was going to do it Salt Lake City, but dude, I've never seen such an aggressive, motivated, and positive group of people than Montanans who came out here and and from all over the place. The preparation angle for people who live up here is is a real thing for sure. Well, they, I hope that they realize it is. You know, your average response time up here talking to some of my LEO friends. Depending on what's going on in the valley, you know, uh, activity-wise, temperature-wise, road condition-wise, thirty minutes. It's real here. Forty-five, right? depending on how rural you get. I, I didn't. There's a lot of that. shit that can go down in forty-five minutes, as you well know. Yeah. So I was just snow biking with a uh, snow bike nation. Uh, I booked them on uh, online. So my snow bike nation, snow bike nation dot com. Snow Mike Nation could be cool. Snow. <laughs> Before we release this episode, we're <laughs> buying that shit. That would be badass. <laughs> um, but you have to be a, a Balloon Boys member. Correct. You cannot be any you – you can't – Balloon Boys. So I've actually thought about this. We could have different chapters, the Balloon Knot Boys. <laughs> and if anybody doesn't know what a Balloon Knot is, go ahead and Urban Dictionary that. <laughs> Somebody's going to do a website, a T-shirt of all this, and we're going to get that swag in the mail. And I'm going to wear it. I will wear that I will too, shirt. proudly. Um, I, I – I was doing the snow bike thing with these guys, and they, they do tours out of Kalispell, a really cool group of guys. And they were telling me about all the things that happen in the backcountry in Glacier National Park. And people die back here. When I was shaking hands yesterday talking to people and like why they found Phil Craft uh, intriguing and why they wanted to get more training, overwhelmingly, a lot of people want that training in this backcountry because they don't get it. 
it, it there's not a lot of places that are doing it. Yeah. And so uh, what it means here is the difference between like life and death. I mean, the f- opening season, week one of the snow that we got in Heber Valley, three people died in that one that first week, including Ken Block, who passed away right behind my house on a snow sled, on a on a um, Damn. a snowmobile, which is tragic. But it's like these things happen all the time, and so it's cool to see that because I. Look, I look into markets like Greg Anderson's PNW, Route 66, San Bernardino, Salt Lake City. That's kind of my quadrant. Roots, um, uh, Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas with Gritter Sport. I like to go to these places where I feel like we are needed because of the circumstances. And um, that just means we're going to do more training here, which is going to be cool. So I have a buddy, uh, Nelson. He's been on the podcast a bunch. He is one of the – fuck, I'm probably going to – Police officer Nelson. He's police officer. He yeah. would say sheriff. He would correct you on that. Yes, he would. He would. There, yeah. He 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 starts to work where the sidewalks end. That's how they talk about it. Yeah. They're fucking weird. All right. Oh yeah. The only thing funnier about the PD versus sheriff jargon is when the fire department steps into the mix, <laughs> and it's like holy shit, boys. But he is uh, part of his job is he's on call with uh, Two Bear Air. They do a they have a rescue helicopter up here in a full like so badass. long hoist crew. They provided free for the valley. Like they flew all the way, I believe, to Bozeman last week on a rescue. And his stories of people and it's year round. Yeah. So in the summer months, um, I think I've talked about this before, but for people who don't know, the population up here just booms because Glacier National Park is just up in the northeast section where you guys kinda were. The Whitefish Mountain Resort, which has world class skiing, flips to the downhill uh, mountain bike riding and all that stuff. Motorcycle stuff. Yep. Hiking, hunting, uh, fuck, single track, you know, off road vehicle, motorcycle, fill in the blank. Like it's any direction you want, know, lake sports. So people are constantly out there fucking themselves up. Yeah. And the stories that I get from Nelson and other people who are on the search and rescue team, and the difference between survival. And being able to be alive when that you know that higher level of care arrives, it's not luck. Yeah. It's how prepared they are going into that situation. There is an aspect of luck, of course. But a lot of the time, it's whether or not they were prepared. Yeah, it's weird. I, and, and I mean that by like, do you have an inReach with you? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, the, the guide that I was with, I, I we actually did a YouTube video with him that will be on Phil Cross Survival's channel because I was interested in what a snow bike guide brings. And- I've been with guides who don't bring shit, and you're like, fire what? that guide. Yeah, fire that guide. Um, Kyle, who's who's the guide for um, Snowbike Nation, he lines out his stuff, and I'm like, okay, so you understand? He's like, yeah. I, like if you don't, you die. Yeah. So you know, he has his tools. He has um, he has first aid kit from Phil Cross Survival. He has his in reach. He has the bag. Um, we just tested these bags for some YouTube content. That are avalanche bags. That yeah, you, the airbags. The airbags. Yep. Um, so I, I bought one from Black Diamond, and I have one from them as well. Yeah, it's the one that you. Um, it, it takes batteries, but you could charge it yep. USB. And it's like if you don't have that and you need it in the backcountry, you'll die. It's one of the reasons why we were talking about doing overland content and overland education in the backcountry of Montana and here in Kalispell. Well, which we need to do because I finally get to pick up my Bronco. Yes, yes. I wish it had been, it's getting wrapped right now. It's gonna get some B, some BRCC love putting on it on the oh, cool. Bronco. So yeah. what are you? So what are you doing? Like you're doing an overland build on this, right? Yes, I got very lucky and got hooked up with Graham from Go Fast Tents. Yes, our campers, Go Fast Tents, GFC, yeah, GFC, yeah, Go Fast Campers uh, down at Bozeman, and he was like, "Hey, man, what do you think about building this thing into like a badass actual overland vehicle?" They're the best, dude. And I thought, I said, obviously, I was like, "Is this like a rhetorical question? Is this a trick question?" Because yeah. I'm fucking down. Yeah. Um. So I think it's gonna be we're gonna deck a thing out as far as I can possibly take it. But then the additional step is I don't want it to be like an asphalt queen. I actually want to just drive the piss out of that thing. Yeah. Are you doing the goose gear setup in the back Correct. with the drawers? Yeah, the Dometic and all that stuff. So wait, are you doing the Go Fast Camper? Are On they top? cut in the top? No, it's already set for it. It comes. Mine has the the factory they have they have a rack system that goes oh, all the way yes. on the top because yeah. it's a soft top it's hard top oh, it's a hard top but you integrate the tent on the hard on top, top so it has you don't a rack have to system. leave you no. could literally run the heat from down below right and it goes into the top you could but i have uh i ordered one of the diesel heaters like you have oh yeah on your yeah, rig yeah, yeah. Those you things, want that yeah. yeah it's like a three-day supply on maybe like a gallon of diesel and it just spits out the Bro, hot air yeah yeah my scout camper i have a scout camper on a bowen custom setup and then i have an alu cab on my uh, right-hand land cruiser when i come out here in may 
which will be right before uh, Overland Expo, where we'll have a booth. Um, I am going to bring my right hand Land Cruiser here, and I'll put it on display out in front. Oh hell yeah! And and I'll do a tourniquet application, but then I'll do a little bit of walk around um, of the the Overland stuff because we'll be going into prime Overland season it's large up here as well dude I mean, it's gonna be badass the rigs come out as soon as the shoulder season turns it's a little bit rainy in may but like june july august september yeah giddy up it's bad are we gonna do overland content together well that's kind of your choice because you own the company i just want to tag along sweet we'll do that yeah let's do let's do it for phil cross survival we'll do some stuff and i'll do some yeah we'll do some runs like go from this location to this location and document the stuff let's go from kalispell to where greg lives and kidnap him without telling him I would little belt uh, Greg or which one? Greg? Which Greg? Anderson? It's gonna be tough. Oh, Greg Anderson. We'll kidnap him. I would much rather. Kidnap he talks Greg like Anderson. he's prepared. Yes. Let's test that shit out. We could stun him. I like this. Yes, you yep. stun him in the back when he's coming out of his dojo and he's exhausted. Just no, he's, he gets in that stupid ass ice barrel. Yes. Right in the throat, carotid shot with a taser. Yes. 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 No one's coming to save you, Greg. Yeah. No one's coming to save I, you. I keep telling him to stop posting that shit. I'm like, why did you make that shirt? I've told you many times I'll come help you if something happens. <laughs> What the fuck, dude? I'm coming to save you. Yeah, like, I'll come to save you. We'll do a whole shirt line of, uh, we're coming to save Greg. And it will blow up. It will do better than I will shirt. do a shirt. I'll do a cleared hot, I'm here to save Greg. You know we're doing that shirt, too. Which one? No one's coming to save you. Are you? You guys are doing it for him? I'm doing it for him because we have the ability to scale yeah. and do it bigger. Not Greg could do it bigger, but P.A.W., is, he's pretty limited at yeah. where, where he's loca located at. And it's so much cooler than you are your own first response. That's my mo motto. It sounds good on a podcast. They're both good, though. But it doesn't look good on a t-shirt. That's a lot. It's like a half a paragraph. It's a, yeah, you can't yeah. have a paragraph on your on your chest. But no one's coming to save you is really freaking cool as a, as a saying. I know. I wish I had thought of it. I don't yeah. have any cool sayings like that. I know. Yeah. We're going to crush it, though. Speaking of apparel, how ridiculous is Alan's setup? Dude, I, <laughs> I that dude blew my mind. Yeah. I don't even know what to say about that. Like you made it seem like you're doing t-shirts and your swag out of like a, a box. Well, they do come in a box, but dude, I was like, wait a minute, this is your t-shirt. I've been trying to hustle you for like years going, hey, years. let's do this thing. And, and then I'm like, what this, this, the digital footprint and the technology that's integrated in this with American made business. If people, I want to do a documentary on a mini documentary on it, on that entrepreneurship segment. It's so insane. Like the he was talking about the pixelation and oh, it's imagery. Insane. It's so badass. There's so much potential there for cool stuff. In a nondescript building off the side of a road. Bro, there's there's like <laughs> a billion worth dollars worth of equipment in there. It's insane. Uh, I mean, you're pretty good at math, but that number's high. Yeah, it's high. Some of those <laughs> machines though, I know some of those machines, and some of those machines are like you're like I print my shit like with a thing where the guy pulls he, yeah, uh, my guy Josh. He like dro he's got a college degree and everything, and he's like dropping these shirts, and he's like very meticulous about all this stuff. That laser machine spits that shit out perfect every time. He's in there with like magnifying glasses. It actually irritates the shit out of me dude. sometimes. Dude, what is? I'm like, hey, it looks good. <laughs> it's like, no, it's it's not good enough. I'm like, Alan, yeah, put it, put it in a fucking bag. Well, the coolest uh, I saw your new run of. Oh, can I say that the Montana BRC? See, yeah, okay. I just said they're that. for sale. Okay, that uh, that is so cool. Yeah, the Montana BRCC shirt, and he had some of those in the bin, and I was like, "What the hell is these?" He's like, "They're just out of spec." I'm like, "These are completely." They fun. look un unbelievably perfect, and he puts it into like a micrometer yeah. and spits it out. Dude, it's your swag and the additional swag that you do is badass because it's Montana based. The lifestyle stuff is going to crush. Yeah. Um, but I now know the. The madness behind it. It's like that dude's a mad scientist. He is. His uh, 12 ounce profit is where you can find him on Instagram. Okay. What is it? 12 ounce profit. I think that's the weight of a blank. 12 ounce profit. And he used to work for Nike and was tired of all the drama. And yeah, I think he used to work for a lot of people. He used to have his own agency, essentially. I think yeah. he was the bridge between a lot of creatives and a lot of industry. But he, he knows what he's talking about for sure. He's one of the smartest dudes I've ever heard talk of, talk about the stuff. And he's got he he motivated me yesterday because um, my my guys were like oh my god we're doing more content I'm like he mentioned about the start point preparedness is uh, finances and it's true so like the guilt that I have about starting a jujitsu program for Philcraft that's self defense based is 
that that's true. It's not a pistol EDC. It's not that. And that makes money because it's popular in our culture. Mm -hmm. But the reality is knowing your finances, being physically fit, having good health and wellness is the key to being prepared. And we're going to integrate all those things full tilt. Like I'm tired of not doing that. It's smart. I don't know anybody who's wrapping finances into that type of ecosystem. Nobody. The, the education, we're, we're good. I told my guys yesterday, I want to get a financial expert for a part of our application, which Leah will be on the app. You will be a host um, on the app. And I'm onboarding with Vinmeo. February 28th, I signed the contract. Vinmeo or Vimeo? Vimeo. So Vinmeo has an OTT over the top software development and application because you know they 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 host videos yeah so they have massive servers and capability and they've learned a lot of lessons on how to um, expertly position the software and user interface for the end user and they produce they do all the stuff the development so we're gonna have a Philcraft app the back end will be a, a subscription based model but we'll have a, a group of hosts um, that are guest host, and we'll have a whole bunch of education, including finances, self defense, homesteading. The list goes on. But the coolest thing is, you can get it on every application, including tethered to your TV, like Samsung TV, Hulu, all the things. I dig it. June six is the launch for that uh, D Day, which is the same day my book drops. But we're doing the book event on the tenth. It's, it's June six is a Tuesday, and I figured not a lot of people are going to show up on Tuesday, but. The, the book launches June 6th. It's available for, uh, you could pre-purchase it. Um, but June 10th here on Saturday in Kalispell at Black Rifle Coffee Kalispell, uh, I'll do a book signing and then I'll bring books for people who sign up for it online. I'll have that up on the website next week. If they sign up online for that, that will include the book cost or fee and we'll do a autograph session and do what like a Jack Carr does. I will sign your books as well for you. You you will be there next to me signing the book. Perfect. And but the, I will sign yeah. your name and write quotes to myself. Yeah, you're a, stir, you're a sentence in that book. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's probably a few syllables too much. Yeah. Uh, what are we doing in Dallas? Talk to me about this so people know. Also, I saw you add a JT. What's, what's he going to teach? Like how to eat a hot dog without chewing? I mean, what do we got? <laughs> oh, man, I love JT. How to uh, shut down your gag reflex? Like, what's his core competency? <laughs> so, what is the date on that? Uh, Fuck, it's next month, like March fourth, I think. March fourth, is it March fourth? Yeah, March fourth. You're right. Yeah. I, we're in freaking March already. It's two weeks away, homie. Dude, this is insane, man. Um, March fourth, we're gonna be in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, doing a leadership seminar. Me and you have done this for over a year. Yep. Uh, all over the place, but you do your leadership component, which is super impactful because it's like a Fortune 500 uh, seminar. And then me and JT will do half and half where I focus on entrepreneurship and he focuses on marketing and lessons learned. Because he, you know, he started, well, he was a co-founder in Black Rifle Coffee, but before that he did Article 15 mm -hmm. and he is a master marketeer. He's one of the smartest dudes I've ever met, almost on the far side of the scale, like the fringe side of the scale. The retard side. <laughs> yeah, you can't say that, though. You're not allowed to say that. Are you allowed? I just said it. You just said it. No, um, I'm not going to bleep it out. <laughs> he he is like on the spectrum. And when you look at his capability, uh, he has a lot to offer when it comes to like a marketeer's journey, but he understands the algorithms. He understands like tech, and he's very intelligent in communicating to that. And so I think if you come to this, you're going to get all the things. Leadership management, but also entrepreneurship. Oh, and dinner and lunch with us as well. I just, you know, so finishing up the 777, it was interesting. You could view that through the lens of traveling through the world and skydiving. Yeah. I actually have developed an entire leadership. It's not, it's not even. It's more than leadership. It's basically a lesson per continent. Seven continents, seven days, seven lessons. Yeah. Because it, we would plan for that for 18 months. And there was everything that you could have thought of, whether it be contingency planning, challenges locally that popped up that we had to work our way through. You know, so you're tired. You could easily be getting frustrated, you know, maintaining your emotional control while you're objectively looking through the options that you have. Was that exhausting? It wasn't physically hard. Yeah. I mean, the skydiving was by far the easiest part. Yeah. I've now tested gravity on all seven continents. So crazy. And it, and it works. Yeah. 
sitting in a coach class airplane seat for that many hours yeah. sucked. Do you know how many hours that actually was? It's like 47,000 total miles. Oh, my god! One and a half times around Earth, essentially. And everything except for the one leg that we chartered because the FAA system had shut down was economy class. Yeah. It was rough. But there was a lesson that I was able to scrape from every single one of those continents, and it has direct application in both personal and professional life. So it's cool because then I have all of that visual content as well. I can kind of show the highlights of the jump really in each cool. one of yeah. yeah. So you're going to do that on yep. March 4th. Yeah. See, that's what's cool about like whether it's technical, tactical, whatever the experience is for the experience training courses we do, always evolving the block of instruction. That, that that's unique in the space. I, I was going to ask have you to about evolve. That. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, I have leadership. It. Leadership is an easy topic t for me to talk about. It's very hard in execution, and, and I, you know, I've been talking a bunch with Mike Sorelli about it. And, and we both agree, like leading in the military is the easiest place to ever lead because yeah. everybody's bought in largely. You know, there's some there's some outliers, but people have been screened, refined, trained, taught over years. They're pointed in the same direction. It's like, hey guys, this is what we're doing. They're like, all right, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, try that shit in IBM, where a guy's just trying to pay off his third mortgage. You know, or going yeah. through a divorce and just doesn't give a fuck and wants to make enough money to surf OnlyFans. Yeah. And you're like, hey, when you, he's just like, fuck you. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a different leadership model. Different Print, landscape. Yeah. So it's easy to talk about, but I also understand people's trying to just blanketly apply military leadership styles to the civilian world. Use with caution. Yeah. You know, the, and that's why I have over the years, I always try to figure out the best way to one, the favorite part of any leadership seminar that I do is Q&A afterwards because yeah. people come to you and say, hey. Concepts are great, but this is what I'm dealing with. I'm like, cool, let's dig in and actually figure out what's going on here, and I'll try to give you something specific and direct. But if you don't evolve, yeah, I think you just you die on the vine, and you're that guy who lives life looking in the rearview mirror. Yeah, I think that's the coolest thing about our friend, friend network is all the guys that are in this circle with us are that guy. You know, They're the guys who want to grow and evolve, yeah. and they're like lifelong students of everything. And that I always want to be that. I never want to think that I have – things figured out what was the coolest thing about the triple seven experience for you was there any pinnacle moment dude i haven't laughed that much in years really was it fun oh my god <laughs> mike's really is so bad at skydiving dude he was doing some crazy like lawn dart shit i was like oh yeah and i mean i'm joking and people are like, you shouldn't be so hard <laughs> on him it's like he should be better i mean don't give me as I much love those videos you guys did back and forth was funny as shit. he's so not good at the internet in the ways that i have learned to be i'm like let my way that that's your best effort. Stand the fuck by. Cause just so you know, people send me footage of you. <laughs> but like it was like being back together. Again, a small group of people who were all bought in. And yeah. it, the more that it sucked, the more we started laughing. And yeah. it was just like misery loves company. And it was just the jumping was the jumping. You know, the least exciting jump was the one in Florida. Yeah. Um Chile was awesome. Antarctica I thought was gonna be the coolest one. And it was hard to get there, and it was cool to be there. I was able to do some podcasts like out on ice sheets in the middle. Dude, of Dude, that's nowhere. a badass podcast. Yeah, your YouTube channel. Yeah, so badass. And then we get to Cairo. Cairo was the coolest by far. Really, dude, bombing out over the pyramids. Holy, the fuck. pictures are the coolest pictures. They're like extraterrestrial shit. Yeah, You've ne I've never seen a perspective of like the over body, the pyramid. And then in the negative space, the pyramids are lined up, and somehow the all shadow. Four of it was unbelievable, dude. It's insane. So yeah. that was the coolest. That was the coolest jump. Is jumping in it. What was the biggest lesson learned from that? The biggest lesson learned. Success or failure is largely determined by your planning and how much time you put into it. Mm. I mean, by the time we got onto the road, the biggest the biggest obstacle we encountered was the FAA system shutting down in Florida. But all we did was sat down and we were like, hey, everybody bring it in. This is what we got. What are our options? And we had multiple options within like – five minutes the most reasonable one was finding a jet we found one within an hour and then raised enough money and it was like okay we're gonna try to raise some money to like get this but if we can't do we have enough money to do it ourselves and people are like yep i'm in for this i'm in for that it's like boom pull the trigger on it what yeah so when the ffa shut down which was like unprecedented it's the first time i mean it, it happened once yeah. before on 9 11 but it's like it, it was crazy how it shut down you guys chartered an airplane. Yep, from Miami to Barcelona, and then went right back. We landed in Barcelona about 20 minutes before our scheduled commercial flight would have landed. Wow. And then got right back on, and we went from, so we did a private flight to Barcelona, 
to economy class to where did we go after that? Uh, UAE. No, uh, Cairo. Cairo's next. The economy thing would have crushed me. It crushed us all, dude. Because everybody's a big dude. It's like economy in those places on those big planes. They fit like twenty people in a row. Yeah. Like you could be in the middle between wedge between like six people on each side. Yeah. It's insane. But the, but again, the biggest lesson learned, which is never shown in any of the Hollywood movies about special operations or what we used to do is how much fucking time we spend planning. Yeah. We had primary, secondary contingency plans. We had a guy in direct communication with American Airlines. We had DZs. We had vehicles. We had planned. I mean, we had thought through what if somebody gets hurt? What if somebody dies? What are we going to? None of those things were going to surprise us along the way. Yeah. Like if Mike died, we would celebrate and move on. Yes. You know, I know, so, that's why I didn't go. I bailed last <laughs> minute. I hurt. I got that intel. Yeah. Sorelli. It's oh, like, Sorelli. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. We were going to just burn him alive on the drop zone, <laughs> a Viking funeral, and then continue on. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny, man. Planning. Planning. Yeah. And, and problem solving, right? It, yeah. And specifically, though, contingency planning. The yeah. what ifs that'll eat your lunch. Six days, six hours, six minutes. That's what they said. That's a little bit too convenient for me. I know. Six, six, six from seven, seven, seven. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. So it was like, it was seven continents, six days. I buy the six hours. I'm not sure I buy the six minutes. Yeah. That would be hard to track. It would be. Yeah. It was wild, and I'll never do it again. Two world records? Two, yeah. What were the world records? Six continents and seven continents. Six, okay. Which is crazy. Nobody's broken that. There was a seven continent record and a six continent record, and they got smashed. Ah. Uh, the previous seven continent record was like seven months. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. That was not That was really good. Yeah. You guys crushed that. Pack a lunch, bitches, if you yeah. want to try to break that one. What's next for Legacy Expeditions? Uh, we have a group of guys who we're looking at getting involved with to row Drake's Passage is likely. Yeah. Uh, which, fuck that. that. That is the between uh, Punta Arenas or somewhere in Chile and Antarctica. Rowing across as opposed to flying across. Incredibly gnarly. Like some of the gnarliest uh, uh, sea swell on, on the face rowing. of Earth. Rowing across. It's been done before. Um, but there are there is a group of veterans. Nobody on our uh, 777 trip is actually going to want to do that. But we're looking at trying to highlight what other people are doing. Yeah. And uh, we're trying to figure out the best way to, we don't have a name for it yet, but you know, the gift of flight, whatever it may be, but teaching people how to skydive, teaching vets how to skydive and giving them that way to come back together with a small group and laugh and have a good time. That's really cool, man. Uh, the Black Rifle is doing a boogie out in Arizona in a few months. I'll shoot you the dates to see okay. if you can fit it on the window. Arizona. The skydive Arizona? Yep, skydive Arizona yep. out in Ely. It's just cool. And now I'm going to go to that one because like, Hanging out, I didn't know Logan and Jericho that well. Fucking fantastic people. I love both those guys. Fantastic people. They're early in their jumping career. It's just awesome. And I was telling them, like, just so you guys know, you're totally fucked, right? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you just did seven of the most epic jumps ever. Enjoy fucking skydive Eloy. I know. Which is an amazing place, and I have hundreds, if not yeah. thousands, of jumps there. It's not the pyramids. There's no pyramids <laughs> in, El in Eloy. There might be pyramids of meth. <laughs> piled high or fentanyl or whatever the fuck they're into out there uh, but yeah so they basically swung for the fences and hit a grand slam in the world series like their first game crazy so but hopefully evan will be out there a bunch of the people it's just cool and then yeah. figuring out though like the legacy expedition the triple seven was cool for me but it has to be beyond me which is why i love the idea of scraping those seven leadership lessons or life lessons from it because then i can pass that on then it goes beyond me and so whatever we do next, that's what I want it to be. Like, I don't want to go on every trip. I, I just don't have the desire. Like, if I'm going to go on a trip, I want to take my wife. Yeah. And I want to do, like, we went to Iceland for 10 days. It was one of the fucking yeah. coolest trips I've ever done, man. That's so cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, one of the reasons I couldn't make that trip, and people have asked me, is I have the kids. Yeah. You know, having the kids and then splitting the time in custody, I couldn't give that. Like, that would literally lay me in court, potentially. And I yeah. was like, I can't do that. And I did backside support for it. Which was amazing because yeah. we're in Antarctica and you're on Tucker Carlson. Yeah. You know, which is amazing. Yeah, it was fun, man. I, congratulations on that. That was pretty epic, man. What's next for you? What are you the most fired up about? Uh, the app is uh, the technical thing. The moving forward is this book. Look, this book is, this is, you. I, I've been talking to you about this book for years. This book is a culmination of a lot of hard work. Jack screwed me because. Car? Yeah. That's what he's known for. Because he wrote the the Ford or the preface for it, and it was better nearly than the book. It's so, like, dramatic. What a like, piece of shit I that know. guy I know. He could have just, like, fumble-fucked that and just made yeah. it, like, just dumb. 
You could have just had so me cool. do it, and it would have been incoherent. <laughs> like, to ha, to he. <laughs> to yeah. he. Yeah. he it, it's so cool, but it's like so good. It sets the stage. But the whole thing behind that is um, bringing that into the forefront and putting out that to a broader audience. And I like people's buy-in no matter what side of the planet they live on when it comes to politics, religion, culture. Because I think um, preparedness is that one thing that kind of brings people together, as we saw at BRCC Kalispell. For sure, man. Dude, our power hour is over, and I don't want you to get in trouble. We There's... crushed it. We did crush it. What do you want to What do you want to close out with? Um, guys, come out to BRCC Kalispell. Out of all the places that I've been, been to, if you're thinking about vacations, come out and see the place and feel the experience. Um, I will get on the calendar very soon likely the next six months, including the one weekend at a minimum a month that we're coming out here to train. Yeah, we got to get you heavy rotation out here. We, ha we will. I, I plan to spend a week per month for the rest of the year in Kalispell, Montana. You're going to need a house. I'm going to need a house. Yeah. You can sell me your lake house. You could just stay at it for free. But you could sell it to me. It's, it's $17 million. <laughs> Sold. Sold. <laughs> All, right. All right, let's get Thanks, you back man. to the significant others. Later.